also a pleasure to be here in uh, Los Angeles and uh, um, at, um, um, at the University of uh, California in Los Angeles. I haven't been here before, and it's uh, certainly um, exciting to uh, talk to a group here uh, keen enough to come out on Saturday morning to, to hear about uh, ADPKD. So what I'm going to talk to you about today is uh, uh, the genetics of, uh, of ADPKD and uh, the kind of uh, objectives of my talk today is to talk about the genes that cause ADPKD, but other ones that can look somewhat similar to the typical ADPKD genes. Talk about the specific mutations we find in the ADPKD genes, especially the PKD1 gene, and how they can be significant to the phenotype we find. And then talk about some situations where the, the normal phenotype can be modified uh, by other genetic factors. So let's talk about the mechanism of disease to start with. Uh, in ADPKD, we have a reduction of the amount of the PKD1 protein, in this case polycystin 1, in all cells in the body. So why do we go on and uh, develop a cyst? We're not completely losing that protein. The classical view here is that we have a somatic mutation, and a cyst only develops when the, the, the total amount of the polycystin is lost. And there's an interesting paper out, I think, just this week in, in Jason using modern genetic methods uh, to look at uh, somatic tissue and showing a high level of uh, uh, somatic mutations. Uh, so supporting this idea of somatic mutations being important in, in ADPKD. And I'll, I'll come back and address that paper in a minute. The, uh, the other idea, and I don't think we should think this is either or, is that the 50% the reduction in itself, in the case of maybe other factors such as kidney damage, chance factors, can also lead to cystic uh, expansion here, although there's still some polycystin protein present. That doesn't mean that the um, further uh, genetic events going on within the cystic epithelia aren't important for the growth and the maintenance of that uh, that kidney. And as I'll show you, some hypomorphic models support that this can be important, at least in some cases of ADPKD. So these are the two major genes, PKD1 uh, and PKD2. PKD1 is a rather large gene encoding about a 13 KB uh, uh, per open reading frame here. It lies in a duplicated area, and I'll show just a couple of slides about that because it makes diagnostics a little bit more tricky than normal. Uh, PKD2 is a, a more conventional dream with an open reading frame here of about 3 kV. So in uh, the studies, I think pretty consistently now, PKD1 accounts for about 78% of families. Uh, PKD2 are rather around about 15%. And this leaves around seven or so percent that are typically unresolved by analysis of these two genes. As I mentioned, PKD1 lies in this, most of the gene, three quarters of the gene lies in this area that's been segmentally duplicated six times further, uh, more proximally on chromosome 16. And these are rearranged uh, relative to PKD1 itself. They encode uh, messenger RNAs, but not functional proteins, probably. Um, but they do show very high levels of sequence homology to PKD1. So by typical PKD1 or even PK PCR or even uh, capture methods, we can inadvertently start screening these pseudogenes when we want to screen PKD1. Traditionally, we've used... Uh, a long-range PCR approach with uh, primers in areas with mismatch with these other pseudogenes to be able to amplify and screen PKD1 for mutations without worry of the uh, of problems with the pseudogenes. Uh, we've used this for Sanger sequencing, for next generation sequencing. But now we're uh, moving like the rest of the world towards more global next generation sequencing approaches using uh, a capture panel approach. And I'll show you uh, some evidence that perhaps a little bit surprisingly, this works quite well for PKD1 as well, despite these pseudogenes. 
So there's a lot of different mutations called uh, ADPKD. This is just an example from one study of the, of the different mutations. Mutations can be found throughout the gene, throughout the transcript here. They can be of every different type that we find mutations in the, in the human genome here. No single mutation accounts for more than 2% uh, of all the patients that we see uh, worldwide. And I think it's reasonable to say that a single act inactivating mutation to PKD1 or PKD2 can give rise to uh, uh, ADPKD. So if we look at the different mutation types, and this is of some significance in terms of the severity of disease we see in the ADPKD. This is the HALT population, the different distribution of the different mutation types in HALT. And we can see about 66% of them are predicted to truncate the protein. That means they either have a frame-shifting um, deletion or insertion. They insert a nonsense mutation into the sequence, or they alter these little sequences at the end of the intron here, and, uh, which alters the way that the, the gene is splicing. Either way, they result in a protein that's likely to be inactivating. The other type of mutation are ones that are in frame changes. These account for about 34% of PKD1 uh, mutations. They can be missense changes where one amino acid is simply substituted for a second amino acid, or they can be in frame deletions or insertions. In this case, uh, a three base pair insertion uh, deletion uh, uh, loses this uh, amino acid but otherwise the reading frame of the protein is maintained. And so you can imagine this, this may not be as detrimental as a, a frame shifting change. We keep a mutation database at, at Mayo where we try and record uh, all of the published mutations and we're struggling to update this right now, but there's over 3000 different variants that have been described in these genes. Uh, most of these in, in PKD1 include in terms of different pathogenic mutations or as over 1900, accounting for over 3000 different families. Again, about 1600 in PKD1 and about 250 in PKD2. A couple of things we do with the database, we try to score these variants to determine whether they might be significant using bioinformatic and con uh, contextual information from the, from the family. And we also try to determine whether they're fully penetrant mutations. And I'll go on to talk about what I mean by that. So what about a role for gene-based diagnostics in ADPKD? You've already heard uh, that imaging is widely used to uh, diagnose the disease in at-risk individuals. So, uh, but I think there is a role. We've already talked about the living-related donor situation, and I'll show you an example of that. Uh, we also talked about the atypical radiological presentations where we have asymmetry. Can genetic testing be helpful there? Sometimes, I would say. I think early onset ADPKD, uh, where we have mild disease with just a few cysts, we're not sure if it's a, a genetic disorder. And all cases, I think, where we have a negative family history, and again, we're not sure exactly where we're, what we're dealing with, uh, uh, genetic testing can be important. I think as we come into the area of therapies in ADPKD, uh, making sure that individuals are effective before we start therapy is obviously uh, going to be uh, important. But probably more important here, the genetic data also provides some prognostic information, try to helping to uh, select these patients that are likely to be rapidly progressive. So this is just an example here. Uh, 41-year-old construction worker, potential donor for the brother with ADPKD, the mother and the brother both have ADPKD. The patient has normal renal function, normal blood pressure, um, but there is some um, mother had a, a surgery for an intracranial aneurysm and the brother had a thoracic aortic dissection, so suggesting there could be some type of relationship with ADPKD here. And we can see in the, in the imaging of this individual, there's one cyst uh, within, the, within the kidney, should you go ahead with the, with the, um, with the surgery in this case. The, the genetics, I think, can be helpful here. 
we're able to show that the, the frame shifting mutation in PKD1 in the mother and the brother is not in the, the, the individual here. This is a definite mutation. We don't have any worries about whether we're really dealing with the pathogenic variant. And probably this will give us a, a better feeling about going ahead and, and using this individual, individual as a donor. If we found multiple cysts within this individual, uh, I think maybe multiple small cysts, even if we didn't find the pathogenic change, maybe we could make a case for going on to do more extensive genetic analysis to make sure that there is not other uh, genetic change here that might underlie the mild uh, cystic disease. So uh, we've already heard that PKD1 is a more severe disease than PKD2, and we can see that in end-stage renal disease data. This is a study from France that showed that PKD2 patients uh, have an average age at end-stage renal disease of about uh, 79 years. What was new about this study is that it divided up the PKD population into the truncating mutations here with end-stage at 56, and... Uh, um, non-truncating mutations in PKD1 with an end stage at, at 68 years. These numbers are a little bit uh, higher than uh, maybe in some earlier studies, but uh, I put down that to uh, French living and good red wine, perhaps. So we can use this information also to, to try and uh, genetic information along with clinical information, the so-called pro-PKD score, to try and identify more rapidly progressive patients. In this study, uh, sex is considered with males more likely having a more progressive disease than females, whether patients have hypertension or, or a urological event before 35 years is also considered evidence of more rapidly progressive disease, as well as the genotype here, which plays a, plays a, a large role. And then if we look at the high-risk patients here, we can see that the average age at end stage is, is much earlier in this, um, this high-risk group than it is in the, in the lower-risk group here. So this can be one piece of information, the genetic information along with clinical information, and obviously along with the imaging information, as we heard earlier, to try and identify patients that are likely to be uh, more rapidly progressive. We can use a uh, genotype also to look at uh, um, uh, polycystic liver disease. We already heard that uh, severe polycystic liver disease occurs in a minority of ADPKD patients, here defined as a total, uh, a height adjusted total liver volume of 1.8 liters. In this study at Mayo, we were able to show the proportion of those patients in PKD1 uh, non-truncating, truncating, or PKD2 was actually equivalent within our population. So it seems that genotype is playing a less clear role in whether a patient's developed severe PLD. We have gone on to uh, uh, see if we can get more information out of non-truncating changes by differentiating patients that are very, uh, the mutations that are very highly predicted, so ones which are non-conservative, and also found at high, highly conserved sites within domains and not only within the protein itself, compared to this type of change, which is more conservative, and although conserved in the, the protein itself, not conserved in the, the domain structure. And so we've had this mutation state uh, two of strongly predicted in-frame changes, and three of less strongly predicted changes. If we look at that in the, uh, a large uh, P population of these PKD1 patients, we can actually see that some of these uh, in-frame changes behave just like a truncating change. So I think just because it's an in-frame change, we shouldn't think in every case that it's going to be associated with milder disease. And in here, we can see that it's only the more mildly predicted uh, uh, the, or the more weakly predictive mutations, which actually have a milder uh, phenotype. And we can see that also if we look at uh, total kidney volume, it's only these uh, mutation strength green, uh, um, three ones here shown in green, which have a lower kidney volume than the uh, truncating and the strongly predicted in-frame uh, changes. 
So we've been interested in hypermorphic alleles or very weak alleles for a number of years. And this family was the one that really piqued our interest because we were able to show that individuals which were homozygous for a PKD1 missense change, well conserved missense change, were the only patients that developed full blown ADPKD, an end stage renal disease. Obviously, we'd expect just one pathogenic change causing the disease in a dominant disorder. Individuals with just one copy of this variant had very, very mild disease, but sometimes they did have, uh, or they usually had a number of cysts within the kidney. What we thought from this was it suggested that this was a, a mutation, but one that's not fully penetrant. And um, we went ahead and generated a mouse model of this uh, mutation, now called the RC model of PKD1. And you can see in homozygosity, the animals are viable. If we usually take out two copies of PKD1, the animal dies embryonically. So this showed it's not a fully penetrant mutation. But then if we keep the animals for a year, we can see that we have this slowly progressive model, somewhat similar to what we see in ADPKD. So good evidence that we think that this is a, a, um, a hypermorphic model uh, mutation of PKD1. Uh, I, unusually, in ADPKD families, probably less than 1% of cases, we can see a very severe presentation of ADPKD, which can sometimes be uh, lethal and often mistaken for uh, ARPKD. Klaus Zeres noted many years ago that there was a recurrence for this very uh, severe disease uh, within siblings, suggesting that there may be a simple genetic mechanism explaining this. And one of the mechanisms is the, the co-inheritance of a fully inactivating PKD1 mutation, as we can see here, with a hypermorphic allele, the same hypermorphic allele I showed you in the, in the last um, slide in the last family here. And we think that the combination of these alleles lowers the level of functional polycystin 1 down to such a level that we get this severe disease. We can also get a, a presentation that looks even more like ARPKD, as we can see in the case here, where it's apparently a negative family history. If we do the genetic analysis in this family, we're going to see that there's not ARPKD alleles that are, are shared by the, the two children, but there are two alleles at PKHD, PKD1, the, the hypermorphic allele I showed you, and another at a well-conserved site in the protein. And it's a combination of these two alleles that we think are important for causing this early onset, uh, early onset disease. We also mimic this in the mouse model by putting a null allele with the hypermorphic allele. Then we get very rapidly progressive disease with uh, large kidneys, about 25% of the weight of the whole animal made up by these kidneys by just 25 days of age, we can see that they generally die early. So very much mimicking the early onset disease uh, that we saw in the A um, ADPKD patient. So there's uh, other uh, diseases that can kind of phenocopy or look similar to ADPKD. One of those is uh, ADPLD, autosomal dominant polycystic uh, liver disease. SEC63 and PRKCSH are the two common genes, although there's about uh, eight, eight genes now known to cause this disease. And this gene is characterized by large polycystic livers, but no, or in this case, just a few cysts uh, within the kidney. However, we feel that there can be an overlap between the ADPKD and the ADPLD phenotypes. In some cases, if we have a very weak PKD1 allele, as we see here, it can result in severe PLD, and again, very, very few cysts within, within the kidney. So there can be some phenotypic overlap between these two different disorders. So this is our kind of IRR idea about ADPKD, where the level of the functional polycystin 1 is very important for how severe the disease is. If we have one inactivating allele, we get this adult onset disease. If we add to that a hypermorphic allele, we can get very early onset disease. If we just have the hypermorphic allele by itself, we have rather mild disease. 
If we have allele which is a little bit more penetrant, we get PKD2-like uh, disease. That doesn't mean that there's not other somatic and other germline genetics as well as uh, chance factors were influencing uh, the severity of the disease. So let's go back to that recent paper that I mentioned to you, uh, where uh, in this case they took cysts from, I think, nine different patients and then isolated the cystic epithelia and looked for somatic mutations. This is mimicking studies that were done a long time ago but now using up-to-date methods, not only specific analysis of PKD1, but also using a whole exome uh, uh, sequencing. And what they found here was a very high level, either by using the PKD1 specific analysis or in com combination with the whole exome sequencing of, uh, of cysts within the, within the kidney. So 90% or 93% of the kidneys having a mutation within the same gene that's causing uh, the disease. So I think this is very strong evidence that uh, somatic mutations are important in the disease. Interestingly, just using, uh, just using the whole exome sequencing, uh, because of the problem of finding PK mutations in the PKD1 uh, gene, they found a much lower level of, of mutations. So I think that this data can be interpreted as uh, somatic mutations being uh, essential for, for the development or the initiation of cysts. However, as, as re rather large cysts were looked at in this study, at least one centimeter in, in size, I think we have to consider that it could be that these somatic mutations are important for uh, generating large and um, uh, the survival and growth of, of large cysts. So I don't think it necessarily means that a cyst is required for the initiation of, of every cyst. So sometimes we see this situation where we have an individual with apparent negative family history, parents without the disease, uh, no affected SIBs here, although children. Obviously, we see this situation often as well, just a sporadic patient. Uh, and probably 10 to 20 percent of, of families with ADPKD could be linked back to a genuine new mutation. One thing that we should think about if we suspect a new mutation in the family is that the mutation may not have occurred here in the egg or the, or the sperm, but it may have occurred at a later stage here, the four cell stage. And in this case, the patient will be a chimera made up of the mutant allele and, uh, and uh, the normal allele. And uh, uh, this has been described a few times in ADPKD, but it's probably much more common than we think because it's somewhat difficult to detect. We can see here an example of a family where the child has the, uh, this uh, frame shifting mutation, not that obvious in the mother here, but she also has ADPKD with a negative family history. If we look very carefully though, down in the dirt here, we can see that this mutant allele is here, but a very, very low level. Probably just 5 to 10% of cells have that mutant allele. If we use a next generation sequencing approach, it's easier to find these change because we look at multiple reads. Here we're looking at over 5,000 different reads. This small change here, this, this uh, uh, nonsense mutation at, uh, in PKD1 was found in just 8% of reads. And consistent with this, you can see that the disease is milder than we'd expect for a patient with, uh, um, with um, a fully uh, inact inactivating uh, PKD1 mutation. So, and so these cases are probably, uh, in, in cases with a negative family history, much more common than, than we actually uh, is recorded so far. So other uh, unusual combinations we can find. Uh, this is within the HALT study, a, a mutation to a PKD1 and PKD2 in the same individual, so-called digenic disease. This individual reached end-stage renal disease with both of these mutations at 43, so a little earlier than you expect either for, even for an inactive, fully inactivating PKD1 mutation. The child here that in, inherited both of these changes was found to have cysts here by 42 days of, uh, of age. Uh, and so that uh, 
The, the disease seems to be uh, more severe if you have two mutations, although not, not the very early onset disease. One caveat here is that the PKD1 mutation is an in-frame change and so may not be a completely inactivating mutation. So uh, sometimes ARPKD can also look somewhat like ADPKD. You know that uh, the typical presentation of ARPKD is in infancy with hugely enlarged uh, kidneys, but sometimes we can see this presentation here in, the, in adults. These are two SIBs here. In this case, there's some uh, dilation of the, uh, the bile ducts, and there's multiple cysts, although you can see the kidneys are not very large in this, this patient. In the sister here, there's not really much evidence of cysts in the kidney, a little calcification, but you can see the uh, characteristic congenital hepatic fibrosis in the liver. So we can usually differentiate these cases by the liver phenotype, congenital hepatic fibrosis, rather than liver, uh, rather than liver cysts, and also because the kidneys in these older patients are usually not very enlarged. Uh, interestingly, even single PKHD1 mutations have been suggested as having a, a phenotypic effect in, in kind of 5 to 10 percent of, of cases here. This can be seen as polycystic uh, liver disease, and this has been uh, suggested as an ADPLD uh, gene, for instance, but also it can be seen as, as some cysts in the kidney. So we need to be careful uh, um, um, interpreting uh, a case with the ARPKD. If the parent has one or two cysts, this may be a manifestation of a, a single PKHD1 allele rather than uh, a family with ADPKD. Uh, autosomal dominant tubular interstitial kidney disease is also a, a disease that uh, is dominantly inherited in families, can result in uh, early end-stage uh, renal disease. So in that way, kind of mimicking what we see in ADPKD, this can be due to UMOD or MUC1 mutations or rarely with these other, other genes. In, in this case, though, the, the difference is usually that the kidneys are not greatly in enlarged, but usually, if anything becomes smaller, they may develop just a few cysts, but they usually become very uh, fibrotic. <coughs> Another gene that's been described as an ADTKD gene, uh, HNF1 beta, is a transcription factor that regulates many PKD genes, in particular PKD2 and PKHD1, as well as uh, UMOD here. The presentation in some cases can look very much similar, very similar to ADPKD. A lot of these mutations are full deletions of the, of the whole gene, but there's a whole range of other phenotypes that can be seen in, in these cases. In fact, uh, the variability, there's a great deal of variability of how the disease presents, but occasionally it can mimic uh, ADPKD. Uh, Hanek, uh, um, is, an, is another disease that, uh, where we see uh, renal cysts occurring, although there's a wide range of neurological uh, eye and, uh, and other muscle uh, abnormalities. You wouldn't think this would normally be mistaken for uh, ADPKD, but we had an interesting family at Mayo, in fact, one where individuals were recruited into the HALT uh, study that you heard uh, about earlier, these individuals here have cysts in the kidney and have a PKD2 mutation. Each of the ones uh, marked in black in this, funny, in this study had a PKD2 mutation. However, the uncle here was also in, in HALT, had cysts within the, within the kidney, but when we did the mutation screening, we didn't find the PKD2 mutation. When we went on to do more extensive genetic analysis, we found that this individual actually has a COL4A1 mutation, the mutation associated with HANEC, and then this individual has two indivi uh, children or a child here and a granddaughter here that have a phenotype much more consistent with the typical presentation of, uh, um, of, of the HANEC phenotype. So we can see here in unusual situations that uh, even this disease can be mistaken for ADPKD, and this individual can be recruited into a a clinical trial of ADPKD patients. 
So even if we do genetic analysis of ADPKD, look for PKD1, PKD2, try and exclude all of these uh, um, phenocopies of ADPKD, we still come up with around 7% of, of patients that are unresolved. So we thought doing some more genetic analysis in these, doing whole exome sequencing of, of families where we have more than one affected individual, then looking at the uh, uh, um, uh, genes that we come up with in the, a larger cohort of patients where we don't have mutations uh, may be productive in terms of identifying novel ADPKD genes. So the first uh, positive outcome of that was the identification identification of GANAB as a cause of ADPKD. You can see this is just a, a missense change in this case. The disease is some cysts in the, in the liver here, and some, but fairly mild cyst, uh, cystic disease in the kidney in two different individuals uh, in this family. This was a good candidate because it's the binding partner here, the glycosidase 2 binding partner, where the other partner causes ulcerosomal polycystic liver uh, disease. We've been able to go on and find about 15 families with mutations in, the, in the, this gene that cause uh, uh, ADPKD, or in some cases, a phenotype which is more like ADPLD. Uh, we can see here that in pretty much all of the cases, of one exception, the patients have conserved renal function even into old age. Uh, we can see in terms of other manifestations of the, of the disease, so particularly liver disease, we have liver cysts in some of these patients, and in a, small, in a minority, we have this very severe polycystic liver disease, one patient requiring a transplant and another requiring a resection. Uh, there's some suggestion that aneurysms may be also more common in these, uh, these patients, but I think we more, need more data before we can be sure about that. Uh, the, the mechanism of disease here is probably by polycystin 2 and the polycystin 1 complex not localizing to primary cilia, which is the site where these proteins uh, probably normally function. We then uh, en um, entered into a more, even more enthusiastic study using a collaboration from around the world, 600 different uh, families. We made a, a panel, a next generation sequencing panel of known and candidate genes of uh, 60 genes at uh, that time. And from that study, we were able to identify DNA JB11 as another ADPKD-like gene. You can see here the phenotype is a, a rather mild uh, cystic disease without real uh, renal enlargement, even in an uh, older individual here. But you note that there's decline in renal function here. So this is not a completely benign the, uh, disease in terms of uh, a renal disease, even though the kidneys have, have not become uh, greatly enlarged. And uh, this, is, again, was a good candidate because it fitted into this whole pathway of proteins that are important for uh, folding, quality control, and uh, ultimate trafficking of uh, membrane proteins, such as the large uh, protein uh, encoded by PKD1, polycystin 1. This one in, in interacting here with the BIP uh, chaperone. And we can see here uh, another patient uh, that we identified in this case. This one has more evidence of polycystic uh, liver disease and rather mild uh, kidney disease. And then there's the three other patients from the study. Again, you can see this rather mild uh, cystic uh, disease, in some cases, uh, more severe disease. Uh, of, a, of the study we published, uh, seven pedigrees with 23 affected individuals. The, the phenotype is pretty consistent here without great uh, renal enlargement. We can see this increasing fibrosis within the, within the kidney. But of note, seven of the patients had uh, end-stage renal disease between 59 and uh, 89 years old. And we could consider this to be something of a, a hybrid between ADPKD and ADTKD. And you can see here, if we look at the, the tissue and look at the UMOD protein here, 
we can see that the, the, the UMOD protein seems to be not localized at the membrane as in the wild type in tissue from the, from the patient. So there's probably problems with trafficking, folding and trafficking of this protein in, uh, in DNA JB11 patients. So now we can see this whole range of, of different proteins within this uh, quality control and trafficking pathway for, for uh, membrane proteins that have been associated with either ADPLD or ADPKD. So if we go back now to look at the, the HALT cohort, I showed you uh, before a rather simplified picture, but now we can see that um, PKD1, just single alleles uh, for PKD1 account for about 52% of the patients. Uh, Non-truncating mutations, single alleles, 52% of the patients. PKD2 mutations, about 15%. So similar here, the, the number that are no mutation detected is down to about 5%. And doing uh, next generation screening, identified some missed PKD1 uh, and even a PKD2 uh, mutation. But we can see that mosaicism, uh, um, complex um, uh, alleles where we have more than one allele making up the, um, uh, the disease-causing allele, diagenic disease, as I showed you, and these other disease genes that I showed you make up a small amount of this cohort. So even in a cohort selected to be typical ADPKD for patients for a clinical study, 1% to 2% of them have rather complex phenotypes. Oh, genotypes. So just I just finish up here by just describing uh, next generation sequencing panel we're now using with 160, 36 genes. This also have genes for, for uh, a wide range of recessive uh, diseases such as Schuberg syndrome, Meckel syndrome, uh, Bartle Beetle syndrome, where they also get a, a cystic phenotype. But where we feel it's useful to screen these because either there might be disease causing, but, or more likely they may have some type of modifying effect. We can see that this capture panel is behaving pretty well. The, the actual type of mutations we're finding here is very similar to what we find in the Hulk cohort when we did Sanger sequencing. It's making us feel that the, 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 the panel is performing pretty well. We can find larger deletions here by doing copy number analysis and even finding the breakpoint in some of these cases, which are then confirmed by the MLPA method. We usually look for these larger uh, deletions. And as I showed you earlier, this method is also good for looking at mosaics. The last, last thing I'm going to mention is that we're also trying to find other genetic factors like common uh, SNPs in the genome to see if they might be influencing the severity of the disease. This is a large multicenter study, including over 4,000 patients with uh, ADPKD. And the idea here is to do a genome-wide association study on patients that are, are just PKD1 uh, and to see if we can find factors that are influenced with either milder disease or, or more uh, severe disease. So at this stage, this is still a, a work in process where we're doing the replication stage of this, this analysis right now. But the hope will be that other pathways that might be important in ADPKD will be identified. And the good thing about this is that we come up with a very clean uh, population here, a PKD1 population, and we can see if we look at this very well-defined population that we see a pretty large difference in the severity of disease between uh, males and females. So I just got uh, three uh, questions, I think. Um, when can genetic testing be helpful in ADPKD? to evaluate a living-related donor, if Im imaging is equivocal in a patient with a negative family history, in ADPKD with very early onset case, an older patient with mild ADPKD, all of the above, or to evaluate all patients at, uh, at risk or suspected of ADPKD. 
Okay, so I think this is I think this is a good uh, good choice here. That all of the above would be would be helpful. I think this is one example, but I think in all of these cases it's helpful. And I, I really feel we're moving towards this as well as as genetic testing becomes cheaper in in this disorder. And I think that we see the value of it. We're going to see much more of that in in patients. So okay, can we go? Oh, maybe I've got to go to the next question. Here we go. Um, so how, how should we do genetic testing? Linkage analysis, Sanger sequencing of the known genes, next generation sequence with a panel that's tailored to look at the duplicated PKD1 gene, whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, or I don't favor genetic testing. Okay, so we have some results here now. And again, I, I think that I would agree with this. I think uh, a next generation panel, but which t is tailored to um, look at uh, as particularly PKD1 is important. I think we need to be a little bit careful about whole exome sequencing as that study recently showed uh, whole exome sequencing, if it's not geared uh, to look at PKD1, I think can miss quite a lot of mutations within PKD1. I think things like linkage analysis are not that useful in ADPKD because the level of new mutations, often we're looking at small families, so I, I wouldn't favor that type of analysis. And I know some people don't like genetic testing, but I don't take it personally. And then finally, if we have a patient who has a positive family history of kidney disease, and parents and an aunt, decline in renal function in their 30s, and their kidneys are not enlarged, but they do have the occasional cysts, what disease would you suspect? I think, uh, I, I think um, the uh, uh, um, ADTKD is probably the right answer here. So we have 60% getting the, the right answer out of a, a representative population of five people. So, uh, so here's the take home message. I don't think I need to uh, read through them and so uh, I'm happy to uh, finish up now. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation. Just a, a few questions uh, that have come up and a few of my own questions. Cost of the gene testing. How, how much would this testing on an average cost? Yeah, I mean, we do research testing, and I think the cost of research testing for the whole gene panel is, is not that much, probably a couple of hundred dollars. I think when it comes to... Uh, a commercial clinical test is going to going to cost more, but I think less than the you know the old long range PCR methods that have been offered. I know, for instance, that Iowa University offers a, a whole kidney panel of genes. I think which has about 300 genes on, and they do particular analysis of PKD1 there to make sure that it's well covered, and that's about two thousand dollars. I think the cut, I think the testing of this is good, or the cost of this is also going to come down even even more and with maybe maybe more specialist uh, PKD things. So I think the the cost now is perhaps not more expensive than comprehensive imaging analysis anyway. So um, and it's more faster too. I mean the time, the turnaround time. You're right, and that's also an issue. I mean our research testing takes some time, but I think in a clinical setting to get results in three or four weeks at least would be a reasonable expectation. If there is a family history, and I thought you said there were declined kidney function or not, but there were cysts, but they did the gene testing and there was negative. So what, what do you do with that? And, and you know, if you do a gene testing, what is the predictive value of that if or ne negative or positive? So I think, um, you know, if we have a, a definitely affected member of a family and we find a mutation, and then we look at other members of the family. I mean, it's telling us that they, they don't have that particular mutation. But there is you know, the possibility of uh, another genetic variant in the family that are, could all base, so be significant. I showed you a couple of examples of odd cases where we have more than one uh, disease within the, in the family. If we have a patient by themselves that just has a few cysts within the kidney, we do genetic analysis and we don't find uh, a mutation, I think the value of that is not very high because uh, um, it probably means that they don't have a fully inactivating mutation of PKD1 or PKD2 because in most cases 
we would find those types of uh, change. It doesn't necessarily rule out that there is some other uh, 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 genetic variant. For instance, there's variants without, outside of the coding region in PKD1, which we're not generally uh, screening for at this time. So it doesn't completely rule out a genetic cause to the, to the disease in the family. And then you mentioned all those, those other mutations for cystic diseases. So is there a panel for that as well? Well, yeah, on our panel that would there, uh, on our panel, and I think most of the, the testing companies are picking these new genes yeah. up as they're identified. GANAB, I think you'll find, is certainly on most. DNA JV11 has only been described, uh, you know, a couple of months, but I think you, you'll find that these new genes also land up on those panels. Adding a new gene is, is fairly facile, so I think that these, these uh, panels can change pretty easily and pretty quickly. Uh, obviously, if there is people at risk and, and you want to do, verify them, then the, the transplant comes up pretty big in our program as well. We do a lot of living donor transplants early onset. Um, and then also for therapies as well. And, and I know Dr. Torres will be discussing this a lot. You said there are other mutations besides PKD1 and 2, and how would that impact treatment and management. And I think yeah, I mean, I think the thing we don't know at all, well, most of these other genes have mild disease. So most of the time, I think, well, I don't know. Uh, if for GANAB, I think that most of the time they wouldn't be indicated for treatment for uh, the, the kidney disease because it's not usually severe. Uh, DNA JB11 is a little bit more questionable. I think the question, the, the point is there that that no clinical studies have, have included those patients or likely to have included those patients. So we really don't know how those patients are gonna do, gonna uh, behave in a, in a clinical trial. So I think that will be a reason right now for probably not putting those patients onto, uh, onto mm -hmm. treatment. Very good. And then, um, and Dr. Torres will be going with that in your presentation, you know, when we're looking at the mutations, the genotype, phenotype co correlation. Um, and uh, the prognostic information, and you mentioned the pro-PKD score, the, right, right. the truncating, non truncating so that's the other part that, and then we went over the, the, the class one, class two classification. Yeah. That's the other place probably, you know, we don't have to do it. The diagnosis is still, in majority of cases, is by imaging studies. Right, and, and, I, and I accept that, and I mean, I'm not sure at this stage, unless the, the genetic test is $200, that it makes sense to do genetic testing on every ADPKD patient. But I think as the cost comes down, the value of it both for diagnostics and for prognostics is, is realized. Doing more patients, I think, makes more sense. And to, uh, right, likewise for the prognostic, I wouldn't say take genetic information by itself and decide whether a patient's going to start therapy or not. But I would say it's one thing we might want to consider some PKD2 patients have very large kidneys, for instance, but they might do they may do pretty well. So uh, I think that uh, taking the genetic information, the imaging information, clinical information together makes much more sense in in defining uh, rapidly progressive patients. And and we we are actually going to have a panel discussion as well. So gene therapy portion, we'll leave it up to that. When okay. the whole panel will be here. But with that, um, I think we'll, we'll, we'll take a break for 10 minutes, and uh, then we'll be back, and then our second session starts. But Dr. Harris, thank you very, very much. Thank you.